Welcome once again to the holiday lectures on science at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Um, you're already familiar with our lecturers from this morning, Doug Melton and Nadia Rosenthal, but we've enlisted a couple of people who have particular expertise in helping to define the way we should think about some of these problems where science uh, intersects with um, important um, societal questions. So the, joining us for um, a panel discussion this afternoon will be Jonathan Marino and Deborah Matthews. Um, Jonathan is director uh, of the Center for Biomedical Ethics at the University of Virginia. He's also a senior fellow um, at the Center for American Progress, and he's also a professor of history and sociology of science at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, he is also a member of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute's Bioethics Advisory Committee, so the Institute actually has a committee uh, that helps us to think about some of these um, questions. Um, and interestingly, his early training was in um, philosophy and psychology. Uh, our other panelist who's joining us this afternoon is Deborah Matthews. And Deborah um, has a, a, a different background from Jonathan. She actually has a, a PhD uh, in human genetics or in, in general genetics. Um, so but at the same time she, uh, that she was taking a PhD in scientific research, she took a master's um, in bioethics. So she's very interested um, in the uh, intersection between ethics and science. Um, Deborah is currently assistant director for scientific programs at the Berman Bioethics Institute at Johns Hopkins University. Um, and uh, she was a a Greenwall Fellow um, and was awarded that fellowship in order to work specifically on policy issues here, here in Washington, D.C. So as you're well aware, people around the world from all sorts of different backgrounds bring different viewpoints on some of the questions that we'll be discussing today. So I'm going to turn it over to Deborah to make a few introductory remarks. Deborah will then uh, hand it over to Jonathan, and then we want to hear uh, from you. We want to hear your comments and questions. So thank you, Deborah. Thank you very much. Um, I will be talking just briefly about uh, some of the policies that relate to stem cell science, not only in the United States, but internationally. Um, the United States clearly is not the only place um, doing embryonic stem cell research. And different countries, as was just mentioned, have approached these problems differently, um, these problems being the sort of social and political tension and controversy that we've all heard about surrounding embryonic stem cell research. So currently, um, international policies include the UN Declaration on Human Cloning. So the UN, the United Nations, uh, issued a declaration banning all human cloning, not just reproductive cloning, which is I make a little mini-me, but also somatic cell nuclear transfer, or uh, therapeutic cloning, as it's been commonly called. The International Society for Stem Cell Research is sort of the primary professional body for stem cell scientists. And they, too, have taken up this question. Scientists have attempted to regulate themselves and have proposed, based on uh, the National Academy's guidelines, actually, that Jonathan will talk about, some guidelines for governing international um, embryonic stem cell research. Av has as have two other groups, the Hingston Group, which is an international group of scientists and lawyers and ethicists and policymakers who looked specifically at the question of international collaboration. So if I'm here in the U.S. and I want to collaborate with someone in the U.K., they have a very different policy over there. So how does that interaction work? Uh, and the International Stem Cell Forum has also been addressing these questions. But specifically, Let's look at what some of the policies are. So these, I'm going to show you a series of color-coded maps. And the general scheme is green means go, means good, do stem cell research. And red is, means stop and is a prohibitive kind of policy. And then yellow and orange are sort of in the middle. And not every country, obviously, has a policy on embryonic stem cell research. Um, but 
different countries based on their cultural beliefs, their political systems, um, the state of the science in their countries, the state of regulatory bodies in their countries, have decided on different regulatory regimes for embryonic stem cell research. Um, for example, in this picture you see that China and India both have very permissive policies. Um, Australia is in the not quite green, but they're actually debating right now whether or not to, to go more green. Um, one thing that I'd like to say about these maps is that they include not just policies that specifically target embryonic stem cell research, but some of these, um, some of the color coding is based on policies relating to embryo research and historically to abortion. So not all of these countries have laws specifically on embryonic stem cell research, but the color coding is sort of the effect of whatever policies are um, present in that country. In Europe, um, you'll see uh, there are more countries have policies um, and quite a large range. Germany and Italy are actually the only two countries that are you're going to see being in orange, although the US federal policy is effectively orange. Um, orange is what we've called restrictive compromise, and it's saying that you can only use um, you can only use embryonic stem cell lines that were derived prior to a specific date. That sort of grandfathers in some old stem cell lines. And the President Bush's policy in the US for federal funding is just like that. The Middle East and Africa, not many countries have, an embry have embryonic stem cell policies, um, but there are a few. Israel is there in green. Um, Iran is in yellow. They're actually trying to become sort of the biomedical powerhouse of the Middle East. And then there's the Americas. So uh, you have nice big blocks of yellow in the northern, far northern and the southern hemispheres. And then you have the United States in its very patchwork quilt sort of uh, scheme. To explain this question of the grandfathered cell lines, so the policy in the US and the policy in Germany and Italy has been that you can use stem cell lines that were created before a certain date. So embryonic stem cells were first isolated, pluripotent stem cells were first isolated in humans in 1998. Well, in your lives, that was a while ago. <laughs> in the science, that's not actually that long ago. Right, so it took 46 years from the time the polio virus was identified to the time there was a polio vaccine. Science takes a long time. So in the US, the cutoff date um, for the use of federal funding for embryonic stem cells is two August of 2001. So only three years after the first pluripotent stem cells were isolated in humans. And this is important because it was very, this deadline is very close to the very beginning of the science. So early stem cell lines were grown on mouse cells, as was mentioned before, or this morning. Um, this is the common way we do cell culture. Uh, but science is moving on from there, and we're trying to develop um, cell or media that don't require mouse cells to grow embryonic stem cells. This is a problem because if the mouse cells have viruses in them that get into the human cells, you don't want to be putting those human cells into other humans, right? That might be problematic. And it might also cause immune rejection problems, which is something that we have, you know, we always are concerned about that with organ transplant and with blood transfusion and that sort of thing. So in order to minimize those problems with stem cells, we want the mouse cells and any associated viruses, et cetera, out of there. Um, also, culture conditions have improved. And stem cell lines, they have this infinite um, capacity to regenerate themselves, but they still acquire genetic mutations. Every time your cells divide, you acquire genetic mutations. And the longer a stem cell line has been around, the more genetic mutations it's acquired. Now, we aren't sure exactly how harmful all those gene genetic mutations are, but the fewer genetic mutations, the better. Um, and these cell lines are now quite old, which is why these are all reasons why scientists are interested in having newly derived stem cell lines. So in the US, as I mentioned, President Bush um, made a speech in August of 2001 and said 
no federal funding for stem cell lines that were derived after this date. Um, earlier this year, the Senate and the House both passed the Stem Cell Research Enhancement Act of 2005, but President Bush vetoed that bill. So currently, the only guidance we have in the U.S. for embryonic stem cell research is the common rule, which is the federal policy that governs all human subjects research, the Dickey Wicker Amendment, which prohibits federal funding, um, the use of federal funding for any research on embryos, and then the National Academies guidelines, which Jonathan will talk to you about, which aren't technically federal policy, but they've sort of become de facto policy because they're good and they're what's out there. You showed the map that shows that, especially in Europe and parts of Asia, such as India and China, there are active research for stem cell, whereas in the US there may be a few states such as California and Maryland. Wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be more wise economically for the U.S. to invest right now into stem cell research? Because if Europe, let's say, who are our economic rivals, do find a cure for cancer, we just end up paying more to, find, to bring that research here. Instead, if we found it by ourselves, once again, the U.S. would be on the top. Uh, since California passed Proposition 71, which is the proposition that funds is t supposed to fund stem cell research in California, we've certainly seen brain drain. Um, so scientists from other states that aren't as supportive of stem cell research or don't have as much funding for stem cell research moving to California. And then also uh, scientists from the US moving overseas to places like the UK where the policies are more liberal. And there have been a number of papers showing that the percentage of stem cell publications coming out of the U.S. has been decreasing relative to the percent of publications coming out of other countries. Um, the economic argument has been a big one in trying to get uh, legislation passed in the U.S. But when you're talking about moral and ethical issues, if you're talking about uh, something that someone feels so very strongly about that it's a question of life and death to them, the economic argument doesn't work. Because in Beijing, they're very interested in what's going on here. Um, I mentioned that, that California had this $3 billion initiative uh, to, to do human ESR research, and they, they smiled, big smiles, because I know they were thinking, this is great. We're all, you know, we, first of all, we all want to go to California. Who doesn't? <laughs> uh, and um, this is a great career you know, opportunity for us. We're going to go to California and do science. And their, their professor, the head of the lab, uh, said, they can go to California, but we're going to bring them back. And I thought that was very interesting, because the, the fact is that China now is investing mm -hmm. in bringing them back, something that they, he, he probably couldn't have said even five years ago with so much confidence. Mm -hmm. So um, this is to make your point. Uh, there's no question, but in the Pacific Rim countries, uh, in China definitely see not only biotechnology in general, but stem cell research in particular as a platform mm -hmm. for improving their economy. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also want to second what, what Deborah said. A few, of the, um, a few of the students, toward the end of the two days I spent with them, raised, started to raise questions about the ethics. And they asked the same questions that students here ask. When is the embryo morally equivalent to a born human being? Um, just the same questions. So. The, again, the, the economics are obviously important, but that's a different category from addressing the ethical questions that people still want to know about. Scientists who work on human cloning, embryonic cell research, or other research that's considered questionable ethically, working in countries such as South Korea or international waters, do they cause problems, complications for groups, countries, governments, who are trying to ethically regulate or create ethical boundaries um, to work on these. I assume many of you heard of Rael and the Raelians and their quest to clone a human. Um, that was not necessarily great for stem cell research. Uh, the scientific fraud case that occurred uh, at a lab in South Korea was absolutely not good for stem cell research. A lot of stem cell scientists in the U.S. ended up spending a lot of their time on the Hill um, during and after that controversy. Uh, in my office, we've taken to calling 
uh, we've coined the term scam cells for those places who are injecting people with stem cells to treat or cure their diseases. People with money are spending, and people without money, frankly, are spending thousands of dollars to travel to you know, who knows where to have who knows what injected into them in the desperate hope that they'll be able to walk, that they will be cured of their disease, that their loved one will no longer suffer. And places, you know, operations like that are not helping legitimate stem cell research at all. There are lots of um, places that like try to scam people and just like give them whatever types of injections. So what things should someone look for to find out if the treatment that they are going to get is legitimate? There are no valid embryonic stem cell treatments today. If someone tells you they're going to give you an embryonic stem cell treatment, they're lying. Um, or putting you at severe risk. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're also, I mean, they're internationally, there's no sort of international regulation for what you can put on, you know, an international website and what you can claim. There's one website claiming that they can treat everything from multiple sclerosis to um, menopause-related sagging of facial skin. I mean, it's really a huge gamut. That, I mean, people claim whatever they want to claim. Uh, I don't know, I mean, beyond just being smart and doing your research into what the science actually says is possible, um, you know, fire beware. <laughs> yeah. I, I think another way to say that is that um, the scientific peer review process that we all go through when we publish our findings is something that any uh, of these uh, research discoveries is going to have to go through. So if you haven't heard about it on the news, mm -hmm. read it in the newspapers, and have an easy way to get to PubMed and look up some sort of a paper that mm -hmm. is peer reviewed, that's in the public domain, that discusses the issue, it's probably not prime time material yet. I think that's the nice way of saying yeah. it. So peer review is really the way in which we police ourselves for, for good science. And it, it fails, as it did in the Korean case, where that paper was peer reviewed in a very prestigious journal of the United States and still got through. However, that's the exception. Most yeah. of the time, if it's too good to be true, it's it not true. Is not <laughs> and I'd point out that paper was very quickly discovered as fraud yeah. and retracted. Yeah. One other reflection one might make on these things we're kind of putting in the basket of snake oil is that one should remember it reflects the desperation of people mm -hmm. who are suffering from debilitating diseases for which there are no treatments. So just because people are claiming things now that aren't not true doesn't mean one should just set aside that whole enterprise and move on. Right. right. First, I want to um, associate my comments with uh, a little um, autobiographical remark. Um, this is Mom. You can see where I got my good looks. Um, as as, as uh, we were hearing about uh, regenerate, regenerative medicine this morning, I was thinking about my mother because my mother uh, was um, 39 years old when she had her right arm and shoulder amputated. She had a, a cancer called a chondrosarcoma. I was five years old. And my mother has never been able to use a prosthesis because um, she did, there wasn't enough, there's not enough left there. It would just hang at her side. Um, um, when we've talked often over the years, it has a happy ending, by the way. She's still alive 50 years later. Uh, but um, she, we've talked a lot over the years about what it would have been like if she could re grow another arm. Wouldn't that have been really cool? Uh, and so someday, perhaps, uh, Nadia or her students will uh, help somebody like my mother to do that. I think it's worth remembering that we're talking about real people. And I, my guess is that everybody in this room has a parent or grandparent or an uncle or an aunt or a sister or a brother who has a serious medical problem. Uh, and uh, if 
if, if — uh, and I hope that they don't, but uh, it's likely that somebody does in your family. And that's ultimately what we're talking about. There are basically three ways to get human embryonic stem cells so far. Uh, the one that is covered in the, in the federal bill that President Bush vetoed, uh, that Deborah mentioned, uh, the one that I think most people feel who support this work um, is the most ethically acceptable at this stage, is from uh, so-called spare embryos or leftover embryos in fertility clinics that have been donated by a couple once they finish their reproductive arrangements. A second way to get embryos from which you could derive human embryonic stem cells would be from embryos made for research, specifically for research using in vitro fertilization. Now, some people who are comfortable with using so-called frozen embryos are not comfortable with creating embryos for research. So for some people, that's a boundary line. Um, and then another possibility is to use so-called cloning, what the scientists prefer to call nuclear transfer, uh, the way Dolly was created. Um, a big issue in this area, a big political issue in California, in fact, has been where do you get the materials to do this? So, um, for example, let's imagine you're a, you're a couple and you want to donate your frozen embryo to human embryonic stem cell research. What are the conditions under which you could do that? Well, one of the things we've said is in our report, in our recommendations, is that there should be no payment for uh, embryos that are going to be used in research, that, nobody should, that no money should change hands. Now, not everybody in the scientific community agrees with that. They're afraid it'll make it much more difficult to get embryos for research, if that's the case. Um, another a related issue is getting human eggs or oocytes. Uh, we've also said that there should be no payment for human eggs or for human sperm. Will that slow down the, the scientific research process if, if there's no payment, if no money changes hands? Uh, if, uh, if people are not compensated in some way for these materials, we, we don't know. There are certainly people who think that's the case and it's something that we're continuing to follow. Well, it seems like the political chargedness and controversy is mo mostly over, or well, more over embryonic stem cells uh, compared to adult stem cells. And uh, simultaneously, scientists are vying more for embryonic stem cells, and I was wondering if you could explain why embryonic stem cells are so much more valuable, or why they're valuable in general, I guess. I wouldn't say they're more valuable, and I might not have made it clear this morning, but there are some adult tissues for which there is no stem cell. And so if one's interested in replacing the pieces of that tissue, then an embryonic stem cell at the moment is uh, the only option we have. Um, in general, politicians try to paint scientists into one of two boxes, either an ES cell box or an adult stem cell box. But in practice, that's not how the world works. Most scientists who are interested in stem cells study a little bit of both. There are some experiments for which ES cells are more informative than others. I think the main point to remember is that embryonic stem cells can make any part of the body, and they could teach us something about life or biology as well as possible medical treatments. And adult stem cells are already used in various clinical settings, so it is not a choice that scientists would make that is an either-or choice. That's not how a scientist would think about the issue. Dr. Rosenthal mentioned cord cells, and I was just wondering what their potential was like compared to embryonic stem cells and adult stem cells. Um, my understanding is that they do have a rather broad potential to become a great number of different tissues, but the problem with them is that they are very poor proliferators. They aren't easy to get to divide in the dish, whereas an embryonic stem cell is an excellent proliferator, and you can expand the line, therefore, very, very easily. However, there is a growing interest in cord blood simply because it's something that is easy to obtain. And in fact, many couples are electing to uh, save the cord blood of their newborn child and bank it in case in a later time those cells could be used, much as an embryonic, personalized embryonic stem cell might be used for treatment of that child should that child need it. So I think there's a, there's a lack of information, but I think that it will be something that people are following up. Is that fair, Doug? Yeah, I, I would amplify it a bit maybe to say that there's good evidence that core blood cells can make blood, of course, and fat. 
and probably some kinds of general connective tissues, sometimes called mesenchymal. But whether or not cord blood cells can make other cell types just hasn't been adequately explored, so it's a good area for research. Uh, it was mentioned that only uh, lines of stem cells that were created before 2001 are permissible in some types of research. Uh, so I was wondering if there have been lines created since then, then what are their potentials or uses? Well, lines of, the lines created before and after August 2001 are scientifically or practically indistinguishable. In principle, they should have some moral distinction to justify the federal policy. I don't believe there is such a distinction, but I'll let our ethicists comment on how one could have drawn a line to say that things before that time are ethically permissible and things after that time are not. I leave it to you, too. Uh, I don't think I can make that case, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the only difference between those lines, aside from age, is whether they're eligible for federal funding or not. Um, originally, when, when President Bush made his speech, he said that there were somewhere over 60 embryonic stem cell lines available for federal funding. It turns out that there are only about 21, but in practice, there are only about a dozen that are available, a little bit less than that. Um, and there are many more lines now available, but not for use in labs that use federal funding. Um, I was wondering if there are enough of the legal embryonic stem cells to support the research that's going on right now from 1998 to 2001. I think it's fair to say that all of this work is legal. Yeah. It's an issue of who pays for the research. Mm -hmm. um, but there's nothing illegal that's ever been done in my laboratory or the other laboratories I know of. So it's not a question of the legality. It's the question of who can pay for it and who can make use of the product, that is, the information or the materials derived therefrom. Is that uh, yes. well, exactly. That is true. Yeah. Um, South Dakota has uh, criminalized embryo research, and there's there are lawyers who will interpret, maybe this is reflected on your maps there, but I didn't see. Um, there are lawyers who will interpret some state laws as also prohibiting embryo research. But um, what Dr. Melton says is exactly right. For the most part, it's not criminal. It's, it's, what we're talking about here is federal funding. And just to give you another number, um, the NIH is, has $28, $29 billion a year uh, to give out in research grants. If you take that out of the equation for a new science, uh, then you're really hobbling the opportunities for the science. And that's essentially what the, the administration's policy does. It takes that money out of the system for embryonic stem cell research if you go beyond the 21 lines. Uh, but I gather the 21 lines that are available for f funded research can be useful, are being used, and can be useful. Mm -hmm. um, but they have certain limitations. And uh, that's why people around the world are developing new cell lines. I was just wondering how much um, future treatments using embryonic research would cost and if it would cause an economic gap between the rich and the poor. Sure. Well, as with any sort of cutting edge technology, it, they generally benefit the rich before they benefit the poor. The poor. Even antiretroviral agents for HIV were available in the U.S. nine years before they made it to Africa. So it is absolutely a concern that anything, any cutting edge research, including treat, any treatment that may come out of embryonic stem cell research, even if that's a drug or chemical based treatment that we've just discovered through being able to model a disease in a dish, will undoubtedly be available in developed nations before it's available in developing nations and will potentially exacerbate the problem. The, something unique about embryonic stem cell research that isn't the case with like HIV drugs is that not only do you have the economic access issue, but you also have a biological access issue because of the concerns about um, immune rejection. So you have to decide if you're going to develop a certain number of stem cell lines, or you want to make a stem cell bank, for example, um, which immunological profiles do you want represented in that bank? So for example, in the US, if you, assuming you don't have unlimited freezer space and unlimited money, you need to have a finite number of lines. So would you, for example, pick the top 10 immunological profiles in the US and bank those lines? Well, you'd be treating mostly white people. <laughs>
So, okay, do you pick the top five immunological profiles from all of the racial and ethnic groups in the US? It would be a lot more just distribution, but you would be treating many fewer people. So it's, a, it's quite a balance, and I think it's a very, it's a very good question. And it's very tricky um, with any new technology, and especially with embryonic stem cell research. How do scientists who have ethical and moral issues with working with stem cells reconcile the issues with their desire for scientific process? Are there a lot of scientists who are troubled by the moral and ethical implications of using stem cells, and how are they regarded by other scientists, and how do they reconcile those issues in their research? Well, go ahead. Maybe I'll have a stab at that. In my own lab, we have regular, not weekly, but sort of every few month meetings to discuss ethical matters like this. And there's a range of opinion. But let's remember that the issue that Dr. Moreno raised, which is what is the moral status of an embryo, or when does a person begin, is not really a scientific question. It's a metaphysical question, you know, a theological question. And people express their opinions and have different views on it. I would say that most scientists I know find the work that's being done to be entirely ethical. It certainly follows generally agreed upon rules and regulations. Um, but that's not to say there aren't some scientists who have an objection to any work involving human sperm and eggs. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that they don't do this kind of research. Mm -hmm. There's, of course, multiple ways of cutting up the issue. One is what should be allowed. One is who should pay for it. One is who's required to do it. Another one might be if you object to this research but then find 10 years from now that you are suffering from a disease that could benefit from it, would your view change or, or would you decline to make use of that medical advance? I know that one of the most, the more popular religious arguments against embryonic stem cell research is that the embryo does have a potential for life. But if you ask a physician who works in any, um, any clinic for um, for developing these embryos, they say that you know they throw away embryos on a daily basis, and I would kind of go with the argument that an uh, embryo does not have a potential for life, for life if they're in a trash bag somewhere. How do you? Where's like the communication that has been lost in in those embryos, and how do people get that information? It does seem inconsistent. If you really believe that, for example, that no federal funds should be used to do. Uh, to do research that involves destroying embryos or that involves embryos, embryo stem cells that have been destroyed, have, have involved destroying embryos to get them. It would seem, if you really believe that, that you should also believe that um, it would, it, we should pass a law that says that it's murder to uh, destroy uh, frozen embryos or embryos in solution in, in fertility clinics. So, I mean, this is politics we're talking about. It's not a philosophy seminar. And in a philosophy seminar, you expect consistency. But in public policy, you can't expect consistency. So, I mean, your point is well taken. Um, my own view, and I'm going to stop talking, is that human embryos have an intermediate moral status between sperm and egg and between a born human being. That intermediate moral status entitles them to be respected. And so one way that we have tried to, act to show respect for them is by having the kinds of rules and guidelines that we've described in the last few minutes. One of the rules against using an embryonic stem cell, isn't it, that it has to be under two weeks, two weeks of age? Mm -hmm. So if we're just using a blastocyst and we're just taking the inner, inner cell mass from that, it really doesn't have a nervous right. system or a heartbeat or it doesn't really have a life. So why, what is the big problem with it, you know, fighting for life when it's not necessarily life? The reason the 14-day uh, uh, standard was developed about 20 years ago, actually, by a British commission, was because some embryo research could be done, uh, not ESL, not getting embryos, because they're six days old, those embryos, but you could go beyond 14 days. Uh, and the fact is that, again, science doesn't tell us what our values ought to be, so you have to kind of use the evidence from nature to give you an idea of what an appropriate marker would be, beyond which you shouldn't go ethically. And because um, at 14 days, roughly, the embryo has a, has a front and a back and a top and a bottom and the beginning of a nervous system and it is then an individual rather than possibly 
twinning, it, that's become a marker that a lot of people uh, are, are, uh, are persuaded is, is, is morally uh, informative. In terms of the government and the state, if it's a question of life and death, couldn't it be argued that by doing stem cell research, you actually, if like you succeed, you actually save more people because you can learn to regenerate and duplicate different types of cells? Mm -hmm. Now that, again, is one of the arguments that's very commonly used. So. For me, I, like Jonathan, believe that the moral status of the embryo is somewhere, has some intermediate status and in that it requires that we have respect and treat it with dignity, but that it's not equivalent to a born human baby. But for some people, that isn't the, that isn't sort of the crux of it. It's the means don't justify, or the ends don't justify the means. So you can't say that because my, you know, my baby might be cured of this disease, it's okay to sacrifice the life of this embryo. For some people, that isn't a fair trade, and that's not something that, that, you can, that you're allowed to do. But it's a matter of belief. It's not something that's e easily changed through argumentation or appeals to scientific method or anything like that. It's, it's a much deeper question. We do have to be careful about utilitarian arguments. Right? There are a lot of human experiments that we could do that might get information that would save a lot of people down mm -hmm. the line. But we don't do them because we think that human beings have an inherent dignity uh, and uh, there are just some forbidden experiments. That's why mouse models and other animal models in the laboratory are so important, for, partly for that reason not only for efficiency, but also for reasons of ethics. So um, while it's undoubtedly true, we could learn a lot uh, by sacrificing some individuals, if you think embryos are individuals. Um, nonetheless, we think also, in general, it's better not to open the field up entirely, uh, but to uh, be respectful of, of whatever moral status we attribute to that individual. Before I take the next question, I might just put some numbers on these uh, embryos so people can think about them. They're estimated to be about 400,000 frozen embryos in the United States, and my laboratory has used 300 of that to create these cell lines. And so you can think about the disposition of these 400,000, most of which will remain in the freezer forever or be destroyed. If one of the ethical arguments against it is whether or not the embryo is, in fact, a human, the people who would benefit from it, I think everyone can agree, are human. And from what I, I know, there's a, they're a lot more numerous. And it, it seems like this isn't really being taken into account too much when people are saying this is unethical. Well, that you're, <clears throat> you're alluding to an argument that I, I, I've often made, and others of us have made. Yes. Um, that's to say there's ambiguity about the moral status of the embryo, but there's no ambiguity about the moral status of a kid with juvenile diabetes or an older person uh, who has a spinal cord injury, uh, like Chris Reeve. Um, nonetheless, I think that argument, uh, the limitation of that argument is that it does, again, tend to reduce to a kind of utilitarian argument. And we need to be careful about um, suggesting that you could, because you're not sure about somebody's moral status, you can sacrifice them for a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. You still have to have, I mean, that, that's fine as far as it goes. You still have to have, it seems to me, some, uh, some limit conditions on what you can do with that entity, even though you're not sure exactly what its moral status is. The fact that cancer is caused is, is being found to be caused by malignant stem cells, wouldn't the, the further use of uh, stem cells in humans kind of uh, cause an increase of cancer, increase the chance for the, a new breed of cancer? Well, for one thing, we haven't really worked long enough with human embryonic stem cells to know just how prevalent cancer would be if we were using them. But this is a very legitimate concern, and I think one of the reasons that you heard from Doug this morning about efforts to direct uh, embryonic stem cells into a certain 
uh, lineage or uh, uh, state of differentiation before using them is precisely because we're concerned about the potential for a stem cell to turn left when it should turn right. And by partially committing them to a particular fate, we hope to circumvent that uh, obvious concern and potential danger of using embryonic stem cells. But it's a very good question. Um, when we talk about curing the diseases, I know that it's a lot more profitable for pharmaceutical companies to treat the diseases. Does, do you think that, that that has something to do with how strict they are with our guidelines? Because if we come out with something to cure diabetes, you know, there's all these things we're doing and, you know, I know that the pharmaceutical companies are making a ton of money off of that. Do you think that that prevents you guys from finding these cures? First of all, any of these so-called cures or treatments will at some point involve commercialization. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they won't be distributed to the population at large. Um, secondly, most of the funding for this research, if not all of it, does not come from pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. The history of market forces suggests that if there were to be some cure for a disease that would compete with a company's primary product, that company will conspire in one way or another to either own that product or develop a co competitor for it. So you, you could say then that the companies will just wait until there's some new way of treating a disease and then buy the rights to produce and market that product. And my understanding is actually that big pharma, a lot of big pharma is staying out of this because the political landscape is so uncertain and it's unclear if tomorrow the research will be illegal and then how much money have they dumped into it with absolutely nothing to show for it. If a person had an abortion willingly and the embryo was fine, is it viable for use at all for um, stem cell research? Um, it depends to some extent at what stage the abortion is done. Obviously, if it's a very early abortion, then the material can be used for research and in fact is used for research under certain circumstances when there's consent. Um, you know, it's the same ethical problem. At what point do you call the fetus a, 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 you know, a human being? But obviously this is a fetus that is unwanted, otherwise it wouldn't be being aborted. And so the same sorts of ethical concerns apply. How do you uh, attribute dignity to that material? how do you go about in using it in an appropriate way? I don't know the legislation like you two do, but I presume that well, it's somewhat I know similar. a bit about that. It, it's an example of something we could spend the whole day on, is making, pointing out the inconsistencies in policies. It turns out that one could use federal funds to isolate stem cells from an aborted fetus, mm -hmm. but you cannot use them to create a stem cell line from an embryo that would be thrown away. And this is just a historical accident of when these decisions were made. So there's so much inconsistency, one shouldn't search for consistency in federal policy. Since it is a really political issue, what you thought needed to get done to kind of form a sort of universal compromise and, and take a really polar issue, which is kind of like, diver, like splitting the country and politics and policy over the world, and uh, what, what needed to get done, you thought, to come to some sort of compromise on that? I think that's right. These are really important questions. We shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't think that we'll ever complete them or, uh, or get over disagreements about them. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I think you will, see, um, you will see a political consensus, which is not necessarily a moral consensus. Yeah. Uh, and, and in this area, for example, if, if and when there is a clinical trial, uh, involving human embryonic stem cell therapy, that will be a very important moment. Um, so I think what we will probably have to look to is real world events, um, incidents that people who are not scientists can identify with mm -hmm. when they can see an actual human being who has benefited. Um, in, in 1978, the first test tube baby was born, baby Louise Brown. There are now over a million IVF babies. My son who plays soccer in college told me that his, his, the goalie of his soccer team is an IVF baby. Uh, you know, they're, they're around now. And maybe you know some of them. Um, but when, when Louise Brown was first born, um, some people thought that she'd be a monstrosity. 
Now she's had her own child in the old-fashioned way just last year. So um, as things move on and people, I think, become more accustomed and see that the consequences are not Frankenstein, uh, I think that will begin to create a political consensus. It's also the case that there was a study by the Genetics and Public Policy Center here in D.C., where they surveyed over 2,000 Americans, sort of a representative sample of the U.S., and asked, among other things, um, and this was a nonpartisan uh, survey, they actually vetted it with both conservative and liberal bioethicists, and their goal was to make them both unhappy, which they succeeded in doing. And they asked uh, the public's view of current policy in the U.S. What do you think of the current policy? Should it be more liberal? Should it be more restrictive? And everyone gave their answer. And then they said, okay, tomorrow a cure for diabetes comes out of embryonic stem cell research. Now how do you feel about the policy? And there was a massive shift towards liberalizing the policy. So Jonathan is absolutely right that this is going to be driven by real-world events involving people with faces and stories and lives, and that that's what's going to change this debate and change the political state of things.